time, Lord. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Jonathan Cain got his big break when he joined the band Journey in 1980. Later, he co-wrote one of their biggest hits, Don't Stop Believing." As a child, Jonathan wanted to be a priest, but his faith was shaken after a fire at his school claimed the lives of 92 children and three nuns. With nothing to erase those haunting memories, Jonathan turned to music to heal his soul. In his book, Don't Stop Believing," Jonathan offers an inside look at his life in the spotlight and how all the roads to success led him peacefully home. Jonathan, welcome to the show. We're glad to have you, you here. It's good to be here. Right off the top of this great book, you say your life <clears throat> has really been guided by two fathers, mm. one a hero, one who's never given up on you. Who are they? That would be my dad and the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. How has that been true in your life? Uh, all through my life. Uh, my father, you know, after the fire, um, he prophetically proclaimed music, you know, to be uh, the path that I was going to pursue and uh, took me to music lessons and um, led me all along the way. But, you know, he, he also taught me how to pray. And he showed me Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ, he would pray and the tears would come down his cheeks, kneeling in the old pew, you know, with his little missile. And I wanted that. I wanted that, whatever that was, whatever that moment was that he was, I could tell there was this joy about him, you know, and, and did you so, ask him what those tears were from? Yeah, he said, those are tears for Jesus. And I said, how do I get there? And he said, you just have to tell him he's your savior and, and that you love him. I'm like, oh, that's a tall order for, you know, little kid. And I, I remember, I said, when do I get that feeling? Is it'll come, you'll have a breakthrough. It'll come, you know? And, and then I said one day to him, I said, is that like a warm glow inside? He goes, yeah, that's how it is. Yeah. Warm glow. And you developed a heart for Christ, even at a very young age, <clears throat> excuse me, considering priest. the priesthood, right? Yeah, I was. I, they were my heroes. And, um, you know, and it wasn't until the fire, uh, you know, and then, of course, with music came, uh, and I could light up a room with my little accordion, mm -hmm. you know. I had all these Italians singing songs and dancing. I'm like, Dad, maybe I That's should. That's a lively bunch, isn't it? Maybe I should be a priest, you know. <laughs> Man, musician. Musician. So, so my father said, I'll help you get there. But that tragic fire, did it, it made you doubt your faith a bit, the goodness of God for I the think, simple you know, years? I, I wasn't, I had a question, did he abandon us that day? You know, was it, was it like in a, where was he? How, you know, and, and, and you know, he didn't teach us about the enemy or chaos or, you know, uh, it was just done by human hands. It was, and, and the Lord was there to heal us all, um, you know, that following morning when we all had to, you know, get in, you know, in the school mode again, you know, and, and they put us in these buses and they sent us to these other schools till they could figure out what was going on. They, the school actually, you know, in the book, I talk pretty in much detail about how it was rebuilt <clears throat> and everything, but we, I couldn't stay there, you know. But so you're around 18 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And a pastor has a word for you. Yeah. What was that? Well, I was, you know, <laughs> it was funny. Um, it was a Baptist church I, I'd never been before. It was on the south side, and I was with my girlfriend, and there was an altar call, and the, he asked anybody that, you know, had, had doubted, you know, Christ, you know, and, and that wanted to return mm. to Christ, and I found myself wandering up there <laughs> in tears, you know, and, uh, and I just kneeled down in front of him, and he said, you've been running. You've been running from the Lord, and run, run no longer, you know, um, and he blessed me. And that was the beginning of thawing out, you know, the thawing out process. Like I realized I was kind of frozen. You know, I, I, I had mm. been maybe going through the emotions. I think a lot of Christians have that happen. You know, they just, you know, assume, well, I'm a Christian and, and not really having that relationship, yeah. you know. So many popular songs from Journey. <clears throat> in fact, I didn't even know my 11 year old son knew of Journey, but we have a drum kit in our room. And last night I heard him playing um, a couple of your songs up there. I didn't even know he was a fan. So oh um, Don't Stop Believing, one of your biggest hits. There's a story behind that song. Tell us about it. Oh my, um, yeah, my father uh, had, you know, been my mentor the whole time, and, and I was in uh, L.A. struggling, and I needed a loan. So I called him, and I said, maybe I should give this dream up. Maybe I should just come home. And his words were, son, don't stop believing, mm -hmm. you know. So I wrote it in a lyric book and took it with me and use it as like a prayer whenever I would get discouraged. And then when I got to San Francisco, I realized, wait a minute, 
that could be <laughs> that's a journey song. Steve Perry would sing that, so I brought it in a rehearsal, and then of course uh, Steve, you know, and Neil uh, had you know breathed life into it and made it into this. You know, sometimes you write a song and it just turns out bigger than anything you could have imagined, and that's one of the things that all three of us are still amazed at. You know that the song has really gone that far. A lot of folks out there would, you know, young people in bands, et cetera, would love the rock and roll lifestyle. Like, mm -hmm. it's so glamorous, the popularity, et cetera, et cetera. But what about the lonely moments? I mean, you're out there in front of the crowds, the cheering, all the adoration. But in the quiet of the moment, is there a loneliness to it? There, there can be. I mean, I, I find that, um, I find, you know, I, you know I, I found counsel in the Holy Spirit. I, I pray, you know, um, I can feel like I've touched um, people with our music. And I have, I have a feel of accomplishment, you know? I, I don't necessarily, I mean, I, I get to be with Paula a lot on, on the road. You know, Paula, my, my, my wife, she comes out, and I, of course, minister with her, but um, there can be, you know, and it depends on how you look at it. You have to train your mind to not feel, uh, you know, that you have to stay in the present and see what you just did you know, was meaningful. You know, there was a meaningful connection with yes, people. You, people. You lifted their spirits up. You made them smile. You made them, you know, hug each other again. That's something that you accomplish. That's part of your work. So it can be, yeah. you know, you can feel that or you can say, wow, that felt good and have a sense of accomplishment and sit back and relax, you know. You mentioned Pastor Paula White, the love of your life. What kind of spiritual impact has she had on you? Oh, so much. Um, she was the one you know, that really picked up where the, when I was 18, you know, it is possible. And I had a question for her when I met her, you know, can I return again to that seven-year-old boy that had the warm glow? And uh, she, she prophetically said, yes. Yeah. She said, I see a book in you. I see a studio, which I built, and I see a date. And that date was when we got married. <laughs> <laughs> I said I'd never get married. <laughs> And, you know, I've, you know, it was kind of, um, she, we had a really deep conversation about life and I realized how much we had in common. We had tragedy. Her father had committed suicide at a, a young age. So she knew about tragedy. She knew about, you know, failed marriage. She, she knew it all, you know, and she, she knew where I was, even with God, you know, and, and encouraged me, you know, to repent and maybe start my walk back. And, and so through her and, and her transparency and honesty and truthfulness, um, I was able to uh, find my way back to the Lord and it's never too late, you yeah. know. It's to, a great message in the book. God and, never gives up on us. No, no, and he's, he's always, and you know, when I, reading this, writing this book was very cathartic for me because I was able to see how much the Lord was there with his angels, you know, helping me get out of the jams and, 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 and keeping my, uh, hopes alive, you know, while I was waiting for the forging process, you know, I feel like I was a sword of his and he was just going to, mm. you know, hammer me until I would, and now I'm celebrating 40 years, you know, in, in rock and roll, which is, that's sustainable. Rock and roll hall of fame, right? That's rock and roll hall of fame. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. It's a great book. If you're a music fan, I encourage you to get it. Or if you love stories of redemption, I encourage you to get it. It's called Don't Stop Believing, the man, the band, and the song that inspired generations. Plus, there's more. Jonathan is releasing a companion album to his book. It's called The Songs You Leave Behind. It features a mixture of classic hits, all new songs, and never-before-released tracks. The Songs You Leave Behind drops on June 8th, so be sure to pick up a copy. Jonathan, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And uh, this will be a great Father's Day it present. Is. It Amen. is. So. Well, I've already got it, so no one has to talk to me. All right. Thank you, Andrew.